my perspective. He has the, he has the true information about what, a, what this life is all about and what our relationships are all about. No, I was going to start with just talking about letting go. It's kind of where I ended uh, what we were talking about yesterday. Just letting go, and it was in the convocation earlier. You mentioned that. Just let go. Let me walk with you so that I may be and become who I'm supposed to be. Okay? And that is what I've learned in this research that I've been doing for the past five years of this concept of letting go. But it's not a practical sentence for many of you because you have people that you're holding on to, and you should. You're people you're trying to heal and help. That's part of your journey. That's part of what you signed up for. So it's not practical to say just let go because no, I've got work to do. I have loved ones I have to take care of. I have people in the Sudan I have to help. She's helping someone in Uganda right now. So people are helping people. And you guys are the kind of people who know it's not just enough to let go. It's enough, you, it's important to know what to hold on to and how to help people to get to the next step. So you have this unique gift. You've all been given in this lifetime to sort of understand spirit and to pass that along to, uh, to other people. And may I say, I've been around the planet a number of times as a filmmaker, as a goofball, as whoever I am. But I've been from Tibet to, to, to Poughkeepsie, and I have never met a group of people like you. And it's wonderful. You know, the fact that I could be talking, you all know John. I was talking to John last night, and he said, you know, I had a past life where I was a slave on a ship and I got killed. And, you know, and then my wife was tortured because of that. Now, where else can you have that conversation <laughs> except Virginia Beach? I mean, if I'd said that in Hollywood, even in Hollywood, they go, wow, what? Was that a movie? Are you, are you, is that a story you're talking about? So I was going to talk about just letting go, but I realized there's something more practical we need to deal with in the time that we have. But I, I'll just tell you my journey really briefly for those who don't know anything about me, and I have copies of my book here. Some people ask me to bring them. So it's called Flipside, A Tourist Guide on How to Navigate the Afterlife. And my journey to the flip side started with the death of a really close friend of mine. As she lay dying in my arms, she said, I'm going to another galaxy where I see myself in a classroom. Everyone's dressed in white, and they're speaking a language I've never heard before, but I completely understand. And I looked at her and thought, well, that's morphine. That's what happens when you take morphine. But then the day she died, a close friend of hers called me and said, I saw our friend Luana, that's her name, in the fourth dimension last night, and she was in a classroom, and everyone was dressed in white. Thought, well, that's classrooms in the afterlife. And her nurse said, yes, that's, that was her recurring dream, classrooms in the afterlife. So I started to think, I, my credits aren't very good in this area, so I don't think I can get into those classrooms. You know, if I'm one of those people who's down here in the classrooms up here, how do you get in there? What are the credits? So I started studying Tibetan philosophy and Buddhism, and I went to Tibet with Robert Thurman, Uma Thurman's father, who was a Tibetan monk. Very interesting cat, written many, many books about Buddhism and about philosophy and about the nature of the journey. But even in that, I didn't eventually get to the moment that I had when I was in New York City, and I had an out-of-body experience where I traveled through deep space and was face to face with my friend Luana. And she opened her eyes as if to say, you wanted to know where I am? This is where I am. Okay, how do I get back there? How can I go there without a spacesuit? If it's true, you know, you start with that. This experience I had, it felt true, it felt real. Maybe it wasn't, but maybe it was. Long story, and some of you have heard it, but a friend invited me to London. I met an Oxford professor who, when he shook my hand, I heard that, I had that feeling we sometimes have, this is who you're supposed to meet. And he told me some months later that his daughter had died and he was having a terrible time of it. And so I sent him a copy of Carol Bowman's Children's Past Lives book. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a wonderful book about kids in the U.S. who remember their past lives. And I thought this would be of solace to him. 
He wrote me back and said, you should read Michael Newton's book, Journey of Souls. Okay, I got his book, opened it up. First uh, story about somebody under deep hypnosis. This is a five and six hour process. Person saying, well, I see myself in a classroom and everyone's dressed in white and they're teaching this stuff about healing. <laughs> I thought, wow, okay, this is the guy I'm supposed to figure out what's going on. If I want to see my friend Luana again, I better talk to Michael Newton. So I called, up, I called up his organization. They said he's retired. He doesn't do interviews. He won't see you. But you can come to our conference. OK. Brought my camera. Met him. Met Michael. After a few minutes, he went, you know how many people want to do documentaries about me? And they never do it. My whole life, people have been telling me this. What makes you different? I, I said, well, I'm going to do it. That's my word. I'm going to make this documentary. So it took me five years. But basically, I got the last interview Michael Newton will ever give. And in the interview, I heard what the process is. And it's pretty simple. And what happened was Michael Newton had a client who spontaneously went into a past life regression. But because Michael didn't believe in past life regression, he grilled the person, saying, you're dying in World War I. Well, what unit are you with? What's your bunkmate? What's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? And ultimately, he sent that information off to the British War Office, and they confirmed this guy had died in World War I. And oh, by the way, cured his illness. He had a shoulder pain. So Newton started seeing past life regressions. And then in the 60s, a woman came in and said, I'm severely depressed. I can't get through life. I don't know why. And in her session, she suddenly went into the life between lives, where she said she was there with her soul group. And the soul group said, you know, we agreed not to be together in this lifetime. So we'll see you again soon. And that totally satisfied her. She came out of the session and Michael Newton was saying, well, well, where are we? Is this before? Is this the future? And she said, no, it's now. It's back there in this life between lives realm. Newton closed his practice and only saw private clients for the next 30 years. 7,000 people under deep hypnosis said the same things about the afterlife, the journey there. Now, that sentence alone will give you pause. And so when I interviewed him, I thought, well, again, it's either true or it's not. And then I interviewed his wife to see if I could hear some lie in there or some mistruth. So I said to her, what did you think about your husband when he came home with this information? She said, I thought he was nuts. I thought they were going to arrest him and take him away until I heard the tapes. And then I realized people couldn't be saying these things who didn't know each other and saying the same things. So it was in that moment I realized I needed to see the tapes or hear the tapes or make my own tapes. So I asked them, can I film these sessions? And they said, yeah, absolutely. You know, because the truth is the truth no matter how you attack it. And if they're saying that this is the truth, then they shouldn't be afraid of me filming anything. And that's the way they, they let me film. So I started filming people under deep hypnosis. And the stuff they said was really profound, but it all coincided. Now, these were people who had been trained by Michael Newton. They were hypnotherapists. So they were sort of doing his technique. And then they offered me my own session. And I thought in a George Plimpton moment, remember Paper Tiger? I got to do this. And I was determined. I am not going to say anything that I don't see. And, I, and if he asked me, do you see anything, I'm going to say no. So I did my session, and I saw everything that everybody else did. I saw my spirit guide. I saw my soul group. I saw a council of elders who advise you about how you're going to choose your next life. I saw all these things. And when I was done with the session, it was like I had taken the red pill in that movie, The Matrix. The earth shifted for me because I understood this was not only correct, but it was something that had to be shared with the planet. So from that point forward, I started filming people under deep hypnosis who'd never heard of Michael Newton, people that I chose, friends of mine. I'd say, you gotta check this out. And then find a hypnotherapist for them, put them under hypnosis, and they had the same, the same journey. Okay? So that's what my book is about. It's about, about what that journey is. And just to give it to you in a nutshell, you know, you, you wonder, like, well, what is it? 
The journey is basically that when we pass away, you're, as we all know, we're greeted by our loved ones. And you might wonder, like, why, are, why do I sometimes people wonder this, you know, when they have a near-death experience? Why do I see loved ones who are here still? The answer is because two-thirds of our energy always stays at home, behind. Only a third of our energy comes with us. This is what people say under hypnosis, thousands of people, okay? But it's confirmed in everything I've ever done. Then the next problem, that's just hello. And the next step is your spirit guide, your guardian angel. Sometimes there's more than one. There might be more than one spirit guide there, and they lead you into your back home, to where your soul group is. And your soul group can be anywhere from 3 to 25 people. The average is 15. Okay, I'm just reporting. It's not my opinion about this. It's just the reports. In that soul group, you recognize the people you've been reincarnating with from... Carol! You're in my soul group. No, but you recognize people that you've been <laughs> reincarnating with forever. And some of them, you are shocked who they are. Because that's, you know, I always hated my father, or I had this difficulty with my uncle. But back there, they're pure, and back to who they all, the pure spirit form... And then they show you, you asked me to play that role. You asked me to be the evil father. You asked me to be an alcoholic father again, and I told you I didn't want to do that. But you insisted, and you had to learn that lesson. I did it out of compassion for you. Now, when I talked about this with a Tibetan monk, because in Buddhism, you know, the, the theory that they have is that between lives you're like a wisp of smoke and based on your karma you wind up in an animal realm or a human realm. Well, that's not what they say. They say the animals have their own realm. Humans are just in our realm and we just choose lives. We choose difficult lives because we think we can handle them. We choose difficult lives because sometimes we're older souls and we want to help other people. You were talking about compassion, about sacrificing your life, these laborers who, who knew they were going to die, but for the greater cause of helping people down the road, said, I, I can do that. You know, i got a thousand lifetimes. You want me to do one where I get shot in the middle? Oh, I can do that. It's a reframe of how we see our journey here on the planet. But so the Tibetan monk said to me, are you telling me that I would choose to be born an HIV baby in Africa in poverty? Why would I do that? And I said, which one of those concepts is negative? And when you examine somebody who says, I can do that, they help everyone, around. even if the baby only lives six months, everybody learns compassion. Everybody learns sorrow, the energy of sorrow, the energy of compassion, so that they can then turn around and help people in the Sudan. They can help people in Uganda because they know that feeling of compassion. They've learned it. So as difficult as that is to wrap our minds around, and the first per person that I filmed was a woman who remembered dying in Auschwitz. And she remembered very specifically her name, her street, her family. I mean, I looked it all up, I found her. And everyone died in Auschwitz. And when she got into this spirit, where she got to talk to her soul guides, her, as they call, some people call them the wisdom makers, it's usually from six to 12 people that are on your council. You've all heard about near-death experiences where you have a past life review. Well, those are the people that are there watching and helping you relive that. In her past life review, she said, why did I choose such a difficult life? And they said, well, she said, you know, I lost everybody. Why would I do this? And then she said, well, they're showing me images. I know this is going to sound hard. It's in the film. I'm trying to remember exactly how she said it. I know this is going to sound hard to understand, but they're showing me that it was harder to play the role of a perpetrator than a victim in this lifetime. Easily the most politically incorrect sentence I've ever heard in my life. It made, gave me great pause. But then as she continued on, she talked about all the lessons you learn every day in the camp. Loyalty, generosity, compassion, 
forgiveness. And she said, from my perspective, it was easier to play that role than the role they signed up to play. So look at it as a stage play. This is the way I look at it. We have a thousand plays we're going to do together. We all agreed to it. Come on, let's do a play. You show up on stage, you pick your costume, you pick your props, you pick what you're going to be doing, and you walk onto stage and you play the role, and you're really good at it. You have like three by five cards. Okay, I'm supposed to meet my wife at Starbucks. What? All right, I can do that. So now you show up at Starbucks, and you know you. But you know it's not so laid out that you're that it's there's no free will. You have free will. You can screw it up any time along the way. It's up to you to make the choices in your journey correct. What they say is when somebody goofs up, then once they get back between lives, they beat themselves up. Oh. I forgot that whole thing. We were supposed to go to Italy for like that whole chapter. I'm so sorry I didn't do that. And that your soul group is going, oh, come on. You know, you did all those other great things. You were fantastic. <laughs> and then you, no, 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 no. I know I was supposed to. I really goofed it up. And they said, come on, take it easy. We, got, we can do this again. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of work. That's why you chew yourself out, especially when somebody, God forbid, commits suicide because they can't handle it here anymore. Then they get back and they go, oh. I have to do this all over again. And your soul group says, you know, all you had to do was hang on till Wednesday. I don't know why you couldn't do that. And then, but I'm just saying, this is what people report under deep hypnosis. They report these stories over and again, over and again. I was there, I did this mistake. It's a bit of a reframe that we're fully conscious between lives, that we choose our parents, that we choose our lives, that we choose the difficulties and stones in our past so that we can learn from them spiritually. Okay, so let me quickly now move to the part of what I wanted to say as a practical way to examine that. Because it's one thing to say it. It's one thing to say And when I did my session, the last thing that I came to, and I spoke to my counsel, and I, there's some pretty funny things that happened there. But the last thing I said was, is there anything that I can bring back with me to tell people? And the answer was, just let go. And I saw that for what it meant. Let go of anger. Let go of envy. Let go of vanity. Let go of all the things that's not your heart. In one of the sessions I filmed recently, they said, somebody asked, what is God? And the spirit guide said, I'm sorry, God is beyond the capacity of a human brain to comprehend. But if you want to experience God, you can do that by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. And that's the experience of God. And I've heard this before. Open your heart. We've all heard it. Open your heart. But when people talk about it from a visceral level, it literally is what we were doing there. Hands on everybody. Drop your judgment. Don't judge other people or what they've done. You know, that trespass against us. It's actually a word that, I mean, love your neighbor as yourself also. Those two things, because they're accurate. That's what our experience is between lives. Because we love our neighbor as ourselves because they are ourselves. They are part of us. So that's, that's really hard to bring to the planet. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you know. Hey, I know you were, I loved you in the last life, but if you cut me off again, I'm really going to. But the practical thing is, and I'm going to give it to you very quickly, is a Tibetan meditation. You guys are really good at meditating. I can feel it. And I was going to talk about it yesterday but it's called Tonglen, T-O-N-G-L-E-N. It means give and take in Tibetan. And most esoteric things were passed down orally for centuries, and then eventually somebody started writing about them. And the Dalai Lama was very uh, open to say, get that stuff out there. People need to examine this. So Tonglen is, this particular meditation will help you and will help your loved ones, and will help Bill get to India. Okay, here it is. 
picture I'm going to just tell you really fast because we've only got so much time. I, normally we would go into spirit and we would ask our guides to help us be here and, have, and ask them to make sure I say it correctly. And Dick is saying, just go ahead, do it. <laughs> okay, let's do that. <laughs> All right. So bear this up, well, it'll put me over a few minutes, but let's just do this. Um, and I want to say, look, I'm not an expert. I've never, I was a monk in a past life. I saw that. I was a monk in Lhasa, in um, somewhere around the seventh Dalai Lama. I mean, I saw the whole everything. I was a librarian. I walked on dirt floors. I lit candles. I used to swear at the abbot because he was an idiot. He didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> but the, the monastery was about a donkey ride, you know, a day donkey ride away from the capital of Lhasa. And uh, at some point, I ran into other people that are in my life today. So, wow, that was fa fantastic reframe. But I lived to be an old, 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 old man. And one observation that I had that kind of confirmed it for me was I said, you know, the problem with being really old is all the jokes that you used to make with your friends, they're all gone. So nobody gets your sense of humor anymore. Your attendant, you know, they look at you and they laugh <laughs> because you're an old dude, you know, and you're there and you don't get that joke. It's the, you know, remember 50 years ago? All right. There's a sadness to that, that all of the things and references that you know are gone and the people around you don't understand them. I thought, well, that's an interesting insight that I couldn't get where I am. But anyway, here's the meditation as I know it. So, do us a favor, close your eyes, and uh, let's ask our spirit guides and everyone around us to uh, help me describe this in such a way as to make it true and, and to make it part of your heart, because that's what we're going to deal with. Tonglen. And uh, normally you would bring and pay homage to a number of different deities, including Buddha, etc., etc. But for now, because we're going to be more of a practical group, Let's just give thanks to Robert for being here. Let's give thanks to everybody around you for being here. That, that there's, there's no accident there in, there in your lives. There's no coincidence that you're here today. This is all part of the journey you're on. Um, the fact that you had your coffee this morning and came down to this session, it was meant to be. And now I want you to picture yourself sitting down the way you are. And right across from you, I want you to picture your beloved the person on the planet that you love but is not feeling well. Whoever that is, a daughter, your father, son, but picture them as clearly as you can, sitting across from you in the picture of health. They're happy, they're smiling, but this is a person you know that is ailing. That's why it's important to put them in front of you. And now see what clothing they're wearing. See their shirt. See their eyelashes. See the color of their eyes. The way their lips turn up when they smile at you. They're sitting there going, wow, what am I doing here? This is interesting. Thank you for bringing me here. And sort of shower them in that kind of golden light as they're sitting there looking at you and you're looking at them. And take your breath slowly, deeply. And as you're contemplating and meditating, and, and if you do this really exactly, you'll, you'll spend a half an hour making them appear. But once they're there, picture where their illness is. They're having an emotional problem. You know where that is. They're having a physical problem. You know where that is. They know where it is. So in your mind's eye, as you breathe in, breathe the illness out of them. Pull it, pull it. Think of it as smoke, maybe black smoke if you want, but it could be a color. If it's a fire, fiery kind of illness, then pull it on like fire. Pull it toward you and bring it into you. I know it's counterintuitive, but bring it into your body and then dissolve it in a bright healing light that you call upon your spirit guides from the part of the universe where healing energy is to come down and see it as a shaft of light just coming straight down onto you bright 
a laser beam, and it dissolves that color. It turns those black smoke into golden energy, warm light, and breathe it out. Breathe it out and back into your beloved. So that space, that spot, that part of their body where they need healing. And do it again. Pull it out. And sometimes you'll start to see the color change. If it's a red fire, then you'll start to see it cooling down. And pull it into you and dissolve it again into this healing, healing, bright light. And whatever color you see as a healing light, if it's green, if it's blue, it doesn't matter. Breathe it back into them. Sometimes you imagine it's a blue light of icicles, ice frost, and it goes right into that part that needs to be healed, that's burning. You can see the coals, and as you breathe on it, the coals start to get hotter, but because you're putting ice crystals on it, it starts to cool down. Breathe in again. Take their illness from them, their stress, their unhappiness, and pull it out and dissolve it, because you can do that. You have this power. You are now going to dissolve that illness and turn it into a healing, healthy, happy, even if they're on their journey to the next life, they're going to go with that healing, beautiful grace that you're giving to them. And do that as much as you can, for as long as you can. Maybe 10 minutes, maybe a half an hour, maybe an hour. You give and you take. Give and take. And then, when you come to the end of your session, thank them for being part of your journey. Thank them for being able to be here in this moment and share this energy with you. And so now let me tell you, as we come back into the church where we are, the Church of Inner Light, that's right, Fellowship of the Inner Light, now we're back here together in our little group and our song on. I just want to tell you that Richard Davidson from the University of Wisconsin has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt in scientific language this exercise cures depression. It changes the shape of the amygdala. And he's measured it. And I attended a lecture where he taught psychiatrists from around the world how to do this process. In his process, he had the monks that he was measuring their brain waves imagine the world as the patient so that they weren't individually helping other people. But what I'm, my point is this, your generosity heals you. It may heal them as well. I had the experience, I can tell you, my wife called me, I was in New York City working on the movie Salt. She said, I'd call an ambulance, I think I'm dying. She had pneumonia, she hadn't told me. And I called a doctor, I know, and I said, could you go to my house? And he said, I'm, I'm on my way. And then I pictured her, just as I'm doing, because I thought, listen, I, I can talk this talk, but I better be able to do it. And I saw in her chest bright red coals. And as I pulled them out, I saw this red color, and it got brighter and hotter and worse. And I did that thing, blue smoke right into her, and then ice, and then snow. I wasn't thinking what color it would be. It just came out of me that way. And when I called her, she said, something just happened. My fever broke. So by the time the doctor got there to give her a shot and all that stuff, she was feeling fine. So, you know, the exercise isn't for her, as much as I hope it helped, but it's for you. That's my little give and take gift to you, because, you know, I know you're stressed. I know this is hard. I know it's difficult. It is what you signed up for. You just have to let go. But while you're letting go, give yourself something, a practical thing. I'm going to let go of these emotions, but I'm going to fix my friend. I'm going to cure my loved one as best as I can. And if they go, they go. Because I'm going to see them again. Because they don't go anywhere. They just aren't here. And that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you.